What will our relationships in heaven be like? And so for the sake of our uh, today, let me just as a sort of a point of review, remember that the Bible talks about heaven in, in, in at least two phases. There's phase one heaven and there's phase two heaven. I've sort of broken it up and said there's, there's going to be two heavens. Existing heaven is our present heaven. It's phase one. It's where a person goes after they, they, they die. If they're a believer in Jesus, they go and then they, they're there until Jesus comes back at which point Jesus is going to set up the great white throne judgment. He's going to determine, uh, award us, and maybe, I don't know, reward us for how we lived here on this earth. And then the Bible says that God's going to create phase two heaven, which is going to be a new heaven, and he's going to refurbish earth. There's going to be this new earth, and he's going to combine the two into one, where the Bible says God's going to come down, and he's going to live with his people, and the people, in essence, are going to go live with God. And so that would be phase two of of heaven, at which point then we will be in eternity for the rest of eternity. Now, in your, in your notes today, grab your app outline if you haven't already. There's a couple of things I want you to write down as we think about our existing heaven, heaven phase one or heaven number one, current heaven. I want you to know that the Bible, and we're going to unpack this here, how it consists of our soul, but no body. Soul, write that down, no body. At death, as we're going to see here, the Bible teaches that our body turns to dust and one's soul immediately returns to God. So our body goes into the ground, it awaits Jesus' return, because remember, it says when Jesus Christ comes back, that the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and those who are alive are, are going to join him, but the bodies then will join sort of this, the, the soul, and so don't take my word for it, let's look at what the Bible says, and so we're going to jump around a lot, and I know that we're reading a lot of scriptures, it's kind of a unique for, for maybe my style, but I want you to go to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Now if you're in a paper Bible, Bible, if you just open your Bible to the, to the middle, you're probably going to land in either Psalms or Proverbs, and if you just go back a couple of books, Psalms, Proverbs, you'll find the book of Ecclesiastes, and then chapter 12, and as always, Beto's going to have uh, the verses up here on the screen behind me, or for those of you watching online, in front of you, but go to verse 1 of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and notice what we're told here. This is the King Solomon who's writing these words. And I got to get my glasses on. So here we go. He says, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say life is not pleasant anymore. Now skip down to verse 5. He continues, he says, remember God before you become fearful of falling and worry about danger in the streets, before your hair turns white like Pastor Mike's, like an almond tree in bloom, and you drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper and the caper berry no longer inspires sexual desire. By the way, is that depictive of as we get older? It's kind of, how many are slowing down in your older age? You know, I know I am. He says, remember your creator before you near the grave, your everlasting home when the mourners will weep at your funeral. Yes, verse six, remember your creator now while you're young before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. This is the key verse, verse seven, for then the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So what are we told here? We're told here that at death, our body turns to dust and our soul immediately returns to God. Now go forward to the gospel of Luke. Luke's found in the New Testament portion of your Bible. It begins with the gospel of Matthew, then Mark, then Luke, then John, then Acts. But go back to Luke. And what we have here in the gospel of Luke chapter 23 is the story of Jesus. He's on a cross. He's about to be crucified. Well, he is being crucified. Uh, he's about to shed his blood and is shedding his blood for the sins of humanity, for you and me. And on either side of Jesus, on a, a cross, are, are two thieves. 
And what we're about to read is a conversation that Jesus has with one of the thieves as they're hanging there on the cross. So look at Luke chapter 23. Go to verse 39, Beto, if you're not there already. Chapter 23, verse 39, and this is what we read. Try to picture the scene in your mind. It says, one of the criminals hanging beside Jesus scoffed, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. So Jesus is on the cross here, right? He's got a a thief on either side of him. And what we're reading here is what we might call a deathbed conversion, right? Of this one thief. And the transferable concept for you and for me is, is the truth. Never, never, never is it too late for us to repent of our sins and experience God's forgiveness, And I think the hope of that, and even as Kirk says, amen, the hope is that don't ever give up on those people who you love. You may have family members, you have made friends who have maybe are wayward, and maybe you've raised them up, you know, for those of you parents or grandparents, you've raised your kids up and now they're kind of doing their own thing, which we all do. We have our, you know, we have the, we have the awesome opportunity to either choose or reject Jesus for ourselves. But maybe you have people in your life who you just know they're kind of living in the world or caught in the world. And I think the hope of this passage is the fact that they might come back to Jesus. And even on their deathbed, even in their last breath, Jesus says, come on, I got you. So I want us to pause with this thought in mind, and we're going to pray right now. I'm calling it the prayer for a wayward friend or loved one, okay? So let's put ourselves in a posture of kind of just receptivity. Put your back, if you're sitting in your chair, just kind of feel the back of the chair behind you. Feel the the, the floor underneath the the bottoms of your feet. Put your palms out in front of you. It's just a posture of, of, of humility. Take a deep breath. First and foremost, say, Jesus, forgive me, or thank you for forgiving me. Now I want you to pray this. Say, Jesus, today I lift before you and you fill in the name of somebody who you're thinking of. Jesus, right now I'm lifting before you, fill in the blank. Now pray this. Say, please draw them to you so that they might experience your forgiving touch on their life just as this thief on the cross did. Deep breath in. Exhale out, say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, good. You know, when we review the conversation that Jesus has with this thief on the cross, this dying thief on the cross, what was Jesus' response to this man's request for forgiveness? He says, today you will be with me in paradise. You know what Jesus was saying, don't you? Jesus was basically saying, I got bad news and I got good news. The bad news is you're going to die today. The bad news is you're going to breathe your last breath here on that you ever have on this planet today and your body's going to be buried and eaten up by the worms. That's the bad news. But the good news is today you're going to join me in paradise reinforcing this truth that at death, our body is buried in the ground, but our soul immediately returns to God. No delay, right? No hold. What'd Jesus say? Today, immediately. You know, one of the early church leaders, as many of you know, was a guy by the name of Paul. And Paul wasn't originally a fan of Jesus, but God eventually got a hold of his heart. He, he was converted. His name was Saul originally. And in his conversion, he, 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 he just changed one letter and he became known as Paul. And Paul was a prolific writer. 
In fact, over most of you know this little trivia. There's 27 books in the New Testament portion of the Bible, and Paul has is, is probably wrote about 13 of them. 12 for sure. There's a little debate on his 13th one. But basically, Paul was this, after his conversion, Paul was a spokesman that God says, I want you to write this stuff down, Paul, so you can give some instruction to the early church as to how to live out their, their faith in, in Jesus. When one of the letters that Paul wrote, he wrote to this group of Christians who were living in the, the region of Corinth, and in a second letter that he wrote to them, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, basically Paul proclaimed the truth that immediately when we die, our soul returns to our creator, God. He says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You maybe have heard that reinforcing, I think, this truth that present heaven, number one, heaven phase one consists of our soul, but not our body. At death, our body turns to dust and our soul immediately returns to God, okay? That being said, write this down, point number two. In present heaven... Existing heaven, where our soul exists, awaiting Jesus' second coming, the Bible teaches that heaven's Christians have an awareness of life on earth. Though our bodies are dead, our soul is conscious. Heaven's citizens have an awareness of life on earth. Though our body is dead, our soul is conscious. Now, let me unpack that for you. Go to the book of Revelation chapter 6. Revelation is the last book of the Bible. Super easy to find. And if you go to chapter 6, here's the context. Let me remind you of the context for those of you who might be new to this conversation. John was Jesus' best friend here on earth. And when, we, when I call, when I, just to remind you, when I use the word apostle John, it just basically means this is, there were individuals who saw Jesus resurrected face to face. So they were still living. And so we say the apostle John, that means he saw Jesus post, post crucifixion, right? And so John, part of the, part of the, the persecution of being an early church follower of, or early Christian was these people, were, they were martyred, they lost their lives. But in John's case, he was exiled to an island called Patmos. And it's from this island that he writes this, 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 this book called Revelation. And basically, he's, he has this dream. Anybody have dreams? You know, I, I, I'm, I don't know what it is, but recently I'm starting to have dreams again. I haven't been dreaming a lot. And I usually don't remember these dreams. But these dreams have been so vivid and I'm hearing, you know, uh, I'm having these audible conversations that it tells me that God's spiritual activity is, is alive in my, in my life right now. And I'm really paying attention for like, I don't know what's going on except the fact that God's stirring me now at, at night. Well, John has this dream, and in this dream, God gives him a picture of what heaven's going to be look, look like or what is going to exist. And I want you to notice in chapter 6, verse 9, Beto, Revelation 6, verse 9, notice what John writes here as he's describing what is taking place in heaven. This is what he says. He says, when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. So in Revelation, there are all these seals. So the, he's describing the situation where Jesus is beginning to kind of prepare for his second coming. And before Jesus comes back, all these events are going to take place. And the fifth seal, so if you read before it, there's one, two, three, four seals that he breaks. The fifth seal, in this fifth seal, John describes how he sees these martyrs that are there present and with Jesus. And in verse 7, notice what he says here. He says, when the lamb, I guess I'm, I'm too behind, or wait a second. Am I reading the wrong passage of scripture? The fourth seal. <laughs> Thank you. So when the lamb broke, by the way, the reason I have these little, this, these glasses is I can't read the little numbers anymore. The verse numbers. Like I can read the verses, but does that happen to any of you where things get hard to see? I'm, I know I'm the only one. Okay, let me start over again. I'm, ram, I'm a rabbit shell. I'm excited. But when the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for their word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. Verse 10. 
They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, catch this, how long before you judge the people who belong to the world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? Now, friends, Jesus has not yet returned for his second coming. We know that because we're still here. But notice that these martyrs, these are people who have been killed for their faith in Jesus. They're asking, they have this understanding of what previously happened to them on earth. They understand that they have lost their life because of their faith in Jesus, and they're asking the question, how long before you avenge our wrongful death? That's what they're saying here. So what the scriptures are implying is that the people who are in present heaven, heaven number one, heaven phase one, currently heaven, they have an eye on those of us who are living here on earth because they know that they have not been avenged yet. They're aware of what has taken place or what hasn't taken place yet because they know that Jesus hasn't avenged their wrongful death. And so here's where it gets really interesting. Your loved ones who have died with Jesus as their Savior and Lord and are in heaven right there now, their soul, not their body, I propose have an awareness of life here on earth. You know, yeah, I always see people pointing, you know, people, hey, you know, my, my, you hear people say, yes, so-and-so is watching over me. I think there's room for us to believe that that's to be true. That your loved ones who have gone before you have an awareness of what's taking place here on this earth. And so spend some time this week just thinking about that uh, uh, because we're not going to go a whole lot more into that. In your app notes, though, I've listed a passage of Scripture that I want us to read together. It's from the Gospel of Luke, again, chapter 16. And so go back to Luke 16. And I know reading these verses takes a lot of time, but it's important for you to know that these are God's words, not my words, okay? So in Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells a story, and there's a lot of controversy about this story. Is is this a literal story? Is Jesus giving us a peek into eternity? Or is it just a story story that he's just making it up? And I don't think Jesus ever told anything just for make-believe. But I want you to notice what he says in verse 19. So go to Luke chapter 16. And in this story, where Jesus is telling a story about two men who have died, one who has gone to heaven, he's finding himself in a place of rest in the presence of God, and the other is sent to hell where he experiences anguish and suffering. And both men, Jesus infers, are aware of each other's situation, okay? So look at what we're told here in this story, starting at verse 19. Luke 16, verse 19, Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for the scraps from a rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. Oh, another mention of food. The rich man also died and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead, or in Greek, the word, they use the word sheol, which is Hades, it's hell. There in torment, he saw Lazarus in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. And so Jesus is saying, this guy who's in hell, present hell number one, can see what's taking place in present heaven number one. Are you with me? That's what he's saying. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there's a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send to my father's home. Send him to my father's home, for I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. What's Jesus saying that hell's going to be like? 
It's a place of torment. Now, is he just joking around? Is he just kind of telling a fixed picture? No, I think he's really telling us, here's, get ready, folks. This is the real deal. Verse 29. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets had warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote, the scriptures. The rich man replied, no, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, you mean like Jesus, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. And we see that today, do we not? Here's the point I'm trying to make. I think Jesus emphasizes here that in heaven and apparently hell, existing heaven number one and existing hell number one is that our bodies are dead, but our souls are conscious. And it seems that in both places, there is an awareness of what's taking place here on earth. This man is aware that his brothers have not yet given his, their faith, put their faith in Father Abraham or God. I'm, it's, just, it's just there, and that's all I'm going to say on that today, okay? So in your app notes, write this down, okay? Eternal heaven number two, after Jesus returns and judges for how we live here on this earth, is what known as the great white throne judgment, and God establishes a new heaven. We talked about that. He's going to establish his new earth. He's going to merge them into one, and eternal heaven number two will consist of soul and body. Soul and body. Now, where you looked at this passage when we first started this sermon series in the book of 1 Thessalonians. So let's go back there again. Some of you might be new. I want you to read with me what Jesus or the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, go to verse 4. Teen. 414, this is what we're told. 1 Thessalonians 4, 414. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have what? Who have died. We, now, they have died, but we were also told that our soul goes where? Today you will be with me in paradise. So why is, what's, who's Jesus bringing back? He's bringing back our bodies. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. What's in the grave? The dust, right? Then together with them, we who are still alive, basically we are, our body and our soul is intact and remain on earth, will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. Friends, these Bible verses describe a bodily resurrection at Jesus' second coming. And in God's new heaven and God's new earth, God is going to dwell with us and we will dwell with him and our souls are going to be rebodied, if you will. But with bodies that are new, renewed and transformed, which means that my knees aren't going to hurt in heaven, which means that that bald spot that some of you have besides me growing on the top of your head. Now, Margaret, you don't have to look at Rob like that. <laughs> Rob, we're probably going to have hair again. Woohoo! The book of Daniel, chapter 12. I, Bettel, can you pull this up? Daniel, chapter 12. I'm, not, I'm just going to read it, but I want you to see it. Verses 2 and 3. Daniel, chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. We're told that those whose bodies lie dead and are buried will rise up some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. So, at Christ's return, this final judgment is going to take place, and then it's going to involve placement into either heaven or hell where people will spend the rest of eternity. That's what the Bible tells us. 
So what's the rest of eternity going to look like? In the closing minutes that I have here, I want to focus on that, okay? So in our eternal home, write this down, point number three. We will enjoy relationships. In heaven, we will enjoy relationships. Now, some have argued, and some might argue, and maybe you believe this, I don't know, that you're, we are going to spend all of our time and our focus on worshiping God because the argument is when we give our attention to people that that's secondary, and I just am submitting today in this conversation that I think that's a false narrative, do you remember in the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, when God created, you know, the, all the world and everything, and then he creates Adam, and he makes a statement in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, he said, it's, it's, not good that man, or it's, it's, it's not good for man to be what? Alone. So pre-sin, I think the Garden of Eden gives us a picture of what this new earth is going to be look, look like. Because sin is not going to exist anymore. Remember, we looked last week that the curse of sin is going to be is going to be eradicated. So God says, I, "I I don't think it's good for man to be alone." And in the Garden of Eden, pre-sin, we're showcased where God creates people with the need and desire for companionship, not only with God but with each other too. And I propose that the Bible showcases how Adam and Eve's relationship was God's kingdom design. Would you agree with that? That's not heretical, is it? Jesus reinforced this truth. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 37 and 39, he was asked the question, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? How am I supposed to live? What did Jesus say? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love who? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Love God, love people. Love God with your whole heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And church, I submit that one of the ways that you and I love God is by loving people, which is why I propose heaven will include relationships with God and with each other. Now, some have argued that when we give our attention to people, we're distracted from giving our devotion and attention to God, which is why they suggest that in eternal heaven, we will be endlessly worshiping God. And I just go on the record as saying I disagree. Because think about this. When Jesus lived here on this earth and he was interacting with people, that didn't prevent him from having a a relationship with his heavenly father. He said, the father and I are what? We're one. In fact, I would even argue that in our fallen world that people help me develop my relationship with God. When the worship team is up here at our worship service, you know, the beginning of our service, and they're playing their guitars, their goal is not so that you will look at them and applaud them and go, oh, you are so great. No, what's the goal of of, of the team? The team is to draw our attention to who? To God. I'm not standing up here so you can look at my beautiful blue shoes. I want you, as your pastor, I want to help you develop your relationship with, with God and with each other. And so I agree that it is possible to make people a higher priority than God, which, by the way, is idolatry. But I'm proposing that it is also possible for people to deepen my relationship with God. That's why you and I are involved in Bible studies with other people. Because you sharpen me and I sharpen you to focus on God, which is why I'm suggesting that in in heaven... We will enjoy relationships, and together in unity, we will worship God. So, here's how it transfers out. Will the relationships that I have with all of you continue in heaven? What do you think? I think it will. Even better than that, 
I think the relationships that are perhaps tainted by conflict or simply broken and unreconciled, I propose that in heaven, those relationships will be mended. You know, there's people that you don't like, don't you, that love Jesus? There's people who are on the opposite sides of the political realm, you know, Republicans, Democrats, independents. You know, some of you love Joe Biden. Some of you love Donald Trump. Some of you are mad at both people. But, you know, there's Christians on both, in both camps. And, and when you get to heaven, you think God's going to let that, those, those differences exist? No, I don't think so. They're going to be reconciled. In fact, Scott McDye, McKnight, who's a prolific New Testament scholar, says this, and I'm going to quote him, and I'm going to start to land the plane here, so hold on. Let me read what he says. He says, I believe that in the first hour of heaven, we will have a face-to-face -face meeting with everyone we've been in conflict with, and there will be truth-telling, confession, honesty, and repentance. No equivocation, no excuses, no pretending. Friendships will be repaired, relationships will be set right. We'll lock arms and slap backs and give hugs and shed tears of relief and joy. How else, he says, can we carry on in peace and harmony if these rifts aren't healed? He concludes with this. Obviously, I don't know the mechanics of how this will take place. Maybe it will be instantaneous, but take place, it must. And we will want it to happen. God will fill us with the desire and the ability to reconcile with each other. Unfaithful husbands will sit down with their wounded wives. Rebellious children will settle with their parents. Unquote. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But it causes me to ask this question. I wonder if there's any of you here today who are currently experiencing a relational rift with anybody. So let's say a prayer today. Let's say another prayer. We'll call it a prayer for relational healing, okay? So if you're in a place right now where you have a, a rift with somebody, maybe you haven't even talked to them for years, I want you to maybe specifically pray for them, but you want them in heaven. And so take a deep breath in again. Fill me up, Lord. I need more of you to love people the way you love them. Now in your heart, say, Jesus, in my life right now, I recognize that I have a relational rift between me and, and then you fill in the blank. So say this, say right now, Jesus, in this prayer, I lay this relationship before you. And I ask that you would begin to heal it. Because I don't want to carry this burden to the grave. Okay, a little bit more. Say, so Jesus... This prayer is my first step toward reconciliation. Please help me. Please heal me. Please remove from my heart my animosity. Please remove the bad angst I have from my attitude that I have toward, and you put their name in again. This is my ask in Jesus' name. Deep breath in. Exhale. Good. Okay. Let's land the plane. Finally and very quickly, the fourth point that I invite you to write down in your app notes is that in eternal heaven, heaven number two, heaven phase two, we will experience family in a new way. We will experience family in a new way. You know, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 8, and you might want to turn there if you, just to double check that I'm telling you what's true, Jesus is having this teaching conversation. He's in someone's home, and in verses 19 to 21, he's told that his mothers and brothers are outside, and they want Jesus to come out. They, they want, they say, your mom and your brother are here, Jesus. And Jesus responds. He said, my mother and my brothers are all those who hear the word of God, right? The message of God and obey it. Jesus says, those people who listen to the word of God and they put it into practice, they're my family. They're the ones who are part of my siblings, if you will, clan. And I submit that in Jesus' response, he gives us a glimpse of what family is gonna look like in heaven. 
Do you know that Paul Marvis Church is, is, is a glimpse of what heaven's going to be like? You know how we interact with each other? There's a reason why I call you brother and sister. It's because in Jesus, we are what? We're family. And our shared devotion to God creates a bond. Would you not agree? That, that is maybe even stronger some, than some of the relationships you have with your biological family. I know some of you better than I know my own siblings. I've spent 30 years of my life, more than that with some of you. We've traveled together and we've done things together. My sister and I, who were only three years apart, and we, I've spent more time with you than I have my own sister. And that may be true for you too. You may be closer to some people here on this earth than in your own, your own biological family. And all I'm suggesting is that I think there's this notion, when people say there's this notion that we're going to have relationships with God or with people in heaven, I think it's unbiblical. Because Jesus reinforces that there's this continuity be between this life and next. There's a reason why you and I should be concerned about our lost friends and neighbors, because we want them to join us where? In heaven. However, did you also know that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 22, verse 30, that there will be no marriage in heaven? Did you know that? No marriage in heaven. Our relationship with each other is going to be family. But here's what I think, I think is safe. I, I think that the intimacy that we feel with some people here on this earth, I propose, that will continue. So while Robin and I aren't going to be married because Jesus says, no, you're going to be married to Christ. He's the bridegroom and we're the bride. I propose that the relationship that we share and the relationship that I share with some of my closest friends, I think that that bond is going to continue in heaven, but we're also going to be family. And so everybody's going to love each other. But I think there's going to be a level of intimacy that you will probably, in the same way that Jesus told his 12 disciples, hey, I got 12 thrones for you to sit on, right? I got 12 places of, 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 of positions of authority for you to rule. And so even Jesus articulates how there's going to be room for a deeper relationship. So let me close with this. David, join me up on the stage. Time for me to land the plane. I want to close with this final question. Is Jesus, the most important question, is Jesus your Savior and Lord? You know, like the thief on the cross, have you asked Jesus to forgive your sins and, and save you a place for you in heaven? And if not, will you do that now? If you've not given your heart to Jesus, will you do that now? I'm going to lead you in a prayer, okay? Now, many of you have. So in this prayer time, I'm going to lead, I'm going to lead those here and those watching online, if you've not asked Jesus in your heart, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But if you have, I want you to pray for again. Pray for that loved one who you know, who you want to see in heaven with you. Pray for that person who's not yet invited Jesus to Christ to be a part of, of their life. But if you've not yet asked Jesus to be a part of your life, I invite you and I encourage you to do so now. Just pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I want to be forgiven. See, Jesus, I want to spend eternity in heaven with you and my family. And so this is my prayer. I ask that you would forgive me. And I ask that you would right now in this moment begin to transform me into the person you've created me to be. Because on my own, I can't get there. On my own, I can't do it. I need your help, Jesus, because I can't change in my own strength. So in faith, I invite you into my heart. In faith, well, that of faith means I trust you. I want you to be the leader of my band. And my Lord and Savior, this is my salvation prayer. Amen. So, if you just prayed that prayer with me, whether you're here in person or you're watching online, I want to hear from you. I want to come along on your journey to help you grow in your relationship with God. So send me a, an email, mike at palmharvest.com. Pretty simple. 
or use the connection card on our app. Just say, hey, Mike, I, I'm interested in learning how to grow my next step. Reach out and I'll, I, I'll get back to you. We are family. And those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, someday we're going to spend eternity as family together. But until that time comes, we got work to do. This world needs hope. This world needs encouragement. This world needs positivity. And you and I get the opportunity to bring the positivity. So would you stand? Let me give you a blessing of positivity today so that wherever you go, whatever places your feet take you this week, you can bring some hope and encouragement to the people in your world. So hands open. Eyes up front here. Sisters and brothers, I bless you today with an increased measure of hope and an overflowing bucket of positivity. As you go out this week, as you go out today, share it with others. Be God's hands and feet. I bless you in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen and amen. Have a good week, everybody.